Well, that is really good uh, for a Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, you guys made it. You know, I love Sundays like this because you never really know quite what to expect. You know, I mean, you've been through a holiday. Uh, everybody's mileage varies just a little bit as to the holiday, what it takes out of you. Uh, I guess it's how you decide to celebrate and uh, with whom you decide to celebrate. And I mean, sometimes it just, uh, well, thank you for being here. That's what I'm trying to say. I love mornings like this. On holiday church services, times we get together in worship, times when um, things are a little different or feel a little different, in my experience, God often has surprises in store. And um, when I say surprises, I mean surprises in the very best possible way. And I know that from the first service um, and my conversations in between services and just what God has been doing in my own heart, uh, I know that this can be a special morning this morning. And I want that for you very badly. So buckle up, it's gonna be fun. Now we're gonna be talking about Thanksgiving. And after all, it is the Thanksgiving season. I'm convinced that many of us are not nearly as thankful as we ought to be. I think we can say thank you. I think we may consider ourselves to be thankful. But I think in reality, maybe we focus a lot on what we don't have, what we want, what we think should be different. And there's a competition of our heart, of our minds. And we're not always as grateful as we ought to be. And I believe that gratitude and genuine gratitude is the best indicator that our heart is soft and that we are walking uh, with uncommon faith. So we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about being thankful. Now I'm going to ask you right now to do something that will come back a little bit later. And um, so I hope you take it seriously. I'd like for you to think of two people in your life who you think or who you know that you'd like to say thank you to. Two people in your life to whom you owe a thank you. Two people in your life who have allowed you to move forward, two who have helped you through difficult circumstances, two who God's put in your life and perhaps you haven't expressed your gratitude to them in the way that you feel you should or maybe that you feel you should after we spend a few minutes together. And then I'm gonna ask you again, a little later in the time that we are together to do something with those two people, with those two names. So start thinking. Some of you are slow cookers. Some of you are microwaves, you're fast, right? Some of you are crock pots, it takes a little time. And uh, so whatever you are, whether you're quick, whether you're slow, you'll have about a half hour to, to process. Think of two people who you really believe it would be a great idea uh, for you to say thank you to. Now, we're gonna be talking about a story today that's familiar to you. It's one of my favorite Thanksgiving stories. Every time I preach a passage, I walk away thinking, man, this should be a series. You probably don't think that. I always do, because I have far more than I could ever say, oftentimes on a Sunday. And this is one of my favorite passages for Thanksgiving, but it's one of those passages that I just, every time I study it, something else comes to mind. God applies it into my life in a different way. And so I want to talk to you about this story today. It's the story of a miracle that Jesus did in the book of Luke. He did a handful of miracles in Luke. Uh, this one was a large miracle, uh, or at least a healing uh, in the scale of miracles that he had done involving healing or involving healing in other people. Um, and it was kind of toward the end of Jesus' ministry. It was a time when Jesus' time on earth was winding down and his teaching had become more pinpointed, um, more defined by a contrast in comparison between the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders, the church leaders, the judgmental, the, the church police, the keepers of religious law, a group of people who um, were passionate about, considered it a hobby and also a profession to scrutinize your life, the lives of the people around them, to decide where there were faults and flaws, to point those faults and flaws out and remind you that you're not really good enough to have a relationship with Jesus. There were a whole group of people like that. And unfortunately, by the time of Christ, they began to represent what we would consider the church now. And so Jesus would speak to them, sometimes directly, and rebuke them. 
Sometimes he would speak to them indirectly by teaching the disciples what it is to be people of uncommon faith. And by this time, it certainly wasn't just the 12 disciples. It was the 12 disciples and the people who were following Jesus and, and committed to living these lives of uncommon faith. And often Jesus would preach and he would, he would say, you've heard it said, or it was often done, or maybe you do. And he would contrast and compare and teach people what it was like to live this life. He was getting ready to leave. He was getting ready to be crucified, to die, to be buried, to rise again, to ascend into heaven, to leave this gospel with a handful of unlikely people, to change the world. And so he was talking in Luke chapter 17 about some themes. Really, humility was the heart of what he was talking about in contrast to the arrogance and pride of the judgmental Pharisees. Not all of them were, but most of them. And, and Jesus, he started off in Luke chapter 17 talking about how important it is for us to live lives of humility, making sure that we don't teach any gospel or any message that adds things, requirements, conditions, terms and conditions to this gospel to make it more difficult for people to find a relationship with Jesus. And also to make sure we live lives that aren't gonna be a distraction for people who don't know Christ or who are trying to develop a genuine faith. And so the first command or, or instruction Jesus gave was to live lives like this. Be careful how you live. Represent my teaching and don't represent anything else. The second thing he started talking about, he began to talk about forgiveness and he essentially said for those people who've begun to live religious lives and begun to sort of um, worship the rules and be swayed by the Pharisees, for people, you know, maybe who are taking church and, and creating it in their own image, when they repent, forgive them. And by the way, if they offend you or wound you or wrong, you forgive them. And he said, forgive them a bunch. And if they repent again, forgive them again. And the disciples called a timeout. And they said, wait a second, Jesus, we're gonna need some more faith. Now, I love that. And this little phrase that they throw out that's right there in sort of the middle of the beginning of Luke 17 was an indicator of a heart that was in fact humble, that realized we need help to live this kind of life, this life of uncommon faith. We can't do it on our own. And then he finishes up this section in Luke 17, talking about how we're not supposed to look for honor and privilege and position and status and power in life. That we're supposed to look for opportunities to give our lives away and to serve the world around us. And then, and we're not exactly sure how soon, Jesus looks at a group of people who were sick. And he doesn't change the subject, he illustrates the subject and he goes from teaching to an object lesson, and he does a miracle. Now, I don't know if you are afraid of germs and sickness. We're in the middle of flu season. Um, I'm not a big fan of germs. I, I would consider myself to be a, a germaphobe. I'd say recovering germaphobe. I mean, I'd get around. I don't walk around in saran wrap, and you know, I don't live in a bubble at home, but I do like my, my hand sanitizer, my Purell. I have them in both map pockets of my car. In case I run out on one side, I can lean over and get the other. I've got, you know, I, I like to keep the Purell handy. If you shake my hand and your hands are moist, they're wet, and you don't explain to me why they're wet. I think about that after we shake hands. Dry your, dry your hands off before you shake. Maybe tell me I'm not like over the top, but I mean, you think about these things. You do. My wife, she's afraid of shingles. And um, I know uh, if you had a real bad case, I suppose you're like, well, yeah, of course. But I mean, Joy's never had it. And, and she just has this thing in her mind that the shingles are, and she's not going to get it. And she got vaccinated as soon as she could just a phobia of shingles. I didn't have the phobia of shingles, but she vaccinated me. She told me, she said, I'm so scared of shingles. She said, if you don't go get the vaccine, I'll wait for you to go to sleep and I'm gonna vaccinate you in your sleep. And so I went ahead and I got the shingles vaccine because I didn't want to get jabbed. And I, and while I'm asleep, that would be inconvenient, wouldn't it? And she'd do it too. You know, my wife, she grew up on a farm. Um, so Jesus walked up on a group of people who were sick, they had leprosy. Now, you know leprosy. You guys have probably been around church for a while, many of you, and you know leprosy was a really bad disease. It was a terminal disease, and you understand it was a skin condition that it, if you had the bad kind of leprosy, at some point you would die. You may not know that it took between 10 and 30 years to die, depending on the progression of the disease and the severity 
Oftentimes it was about that 20 year period of suffering with leprosy that a person would succumb to something else and would pass away. Leprosy would separate you from your family. It would separate you from your, your home. It would separate you from your job. You'd have to go live in a colony with other people who were destined to die. And your life literally was spent trying to survive around a group of people who you knew would either watch you drop dead or you in turn would watch them drop dead and you were just waiting. Now to frame this correctly, in a sense, all of us are in that same condition, you and I. Um, I don't wanna be morbid, after all it's Thanksgiving weekend or the weekend after, but life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. The moment that we're born, we begin to die. All of us are dying. The question is, where are we going to end up? And what do we do in the meantime? So in a sense, all of us are a group of lepers living with a condition that has to be reversed. And you'll see in this story that living with this condition separated them from many things, but it also united them with some very important things. And so Jesus walks up with them among them and talks to them. Disciples are following, people are paying attention. The judgmental Pharisees who feel like these lepers probably had it coming or their parents did, that it was some divine judgment, they deserved it. Jesus did something astounding, miraculous. Let me share with you what it is. Now on his way to Jerusalem, and this was his final time, and he will have been there four times, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. Why? Because they had to. Now, if you read the Old Testament law, if you read Leviticus and you read Deuteronomy, the kind of the Bible, the parts of the Bible that'll put you to sleep if you're not really careful, it's all 100% true, but it's talking about rules and regulations that we don't li really live by anymore. It talks about how lepers had to stand at a distance. Now, surprisingly enough, us having been through a pandemic, um, the distance lepers had to stand from a person who didn't have leprosy was four cubits. Does anybody know how long a cubit is? 18 inches, four cubits, six feet. They had to stand six feet apart. They also had to wear face coverings, masks. Dr. Fauci was influencing them even years before his time. It was very similar to what they were asking us to do here recently. Apparently the pandemic's over, so we're moving on to whatever's next. So they were standing at a distance from Jesus. They had to call out and say, don't come near, I've got leprosy. And um, Jesus spoke to them. Now in Luke chapter five, he healed one person with leprosy and touched them. So Jesus wasn't scared to touch a leper, but they believed and ended up being true that you could get leprosy by touch, human touch, but also by saliva and transfer in the normal ways. And so they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went. As they went, they were cleansed. Now I want you to think about this. 10 people who had leprosy woke up in the morning, looking at their body, realizing that they were going to die. Of the 10, some probably closer to death than others, leprosy would start either the tips of the ears, the tip of the nose. Once you saw it, you knew it was going to progress. It was just a matter of time. And so Jesus looked at them and when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. Now I've told you in previous times when we've talked about this passage that the priests, the preachers were the health inspectors and had to look people over and make sure they didn't have leprosy. It was an eight day process. And if they weren't satisfied, they could make you do another eight days and even in turn a third eight day process of making sure that you were cured. But all good Jews knew that they had to go to the priest to be cleared before they could enter society or re-enter society without having this terrible disease. And so Jesus told these 10 to go and they went. But when they took off and took that first step, they hadn't been cured yet. So there was some faith here. And we don't know how long or how far even the priest was. Were they going to Jerusalem? Were they gonna to go to a village nearby and find a synagogue? We don't know if it was five minutes into the journey, 
when one looked at the next and said, man, your nose used to be all messed up. Now it looks great. Or look at your fingers. I mean, all of a sudden, maybe it was five hours. Maybe it was that night. Maybe it was a multiple day trip. But at some point in the trip, these 10 looked at each other and realized they had been cured. Miraculous. One morning woke up with a death sentence. One night went to bed cured. Now, they were on their way. As they went, they were cleansed. And this word cleansed means healed physically. Put that in the back of your mind. It's important a little bit later. Let's keep going. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back and he praised God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And the Bible says, and he was a Samaritan. Now, again, we've talked about Samaritans and Jews and how they hated each other. Uh, the Bible has incidents, and unfortunately, of the division between Samaritans and Jews. The Samaritans had taken part of Judaism and kind of made it their own. And they fought each other and hated each other. And the legend church history tells us that if a Samaritan man had stumbled across the border and was in a Jewish village, that he may be beaten within an inch of his life, sometimes losing his life and vice versa. There was hatred that had been passed down from father to son, to son to father, to mother, to daughter for generations and a division that was um, insurmountable except for, for one thing. They had leprosy. My pastor growing up, he said, sin and suffering are the two things that unite all people. And even something as significant as being a Jew or a Samaritan really didn't matter that much. Like Democrats and Republicans these days, only times 10. Oh, you're sick? I'm sick too. All the stuff that mattered yesterday, it doesn't matter today, does it? You and I should realize the same thing. You're sick? I'm sick too. All this stuff that could matter at a different time doesn't really matter today. The Bible says he was a Samaritan. Now, I think it's also interesting that Jesus sent a Samaritan to go to a Jewish priest. He was part of the 10. If you know why and you know what would have happened, please tell me because I haven't been able to figure this out. And just because I haven't doesn't mean it can't be figured out. But a Samaritan would not have been allowed in a synagogue, would not have been allowed to talk to a, a Jewish priest. He wouldn't have been welcome in the village, leprosy or no leprosy. And he was one of the 10. And nine continued on back to their own man-made religion. Thankful, probably. Changed, just physically, but largely the same. One stopped. Nothing to go back to. Turned to the one who made it possible for everything to be different and came back to him and did three things. The first thing, he came back praising God in a loud voice. The second thing, throwing himself at Jesus' feet. The third thing, thanking Jesus for what he had done. Now, this is why it's important to us. I wanna to talk to you about this for a second because it's a pattern that I think you and I should follow in our own lives. The first thing, is that we, in fact, should be grateful and express our gratitude for God and how great he is. That's easy to do. Easy to do, important, absolutely. Who is God? God is all powerful, he's all knowing, he's everywhere. He controls all of the billions of contingencies in life to bring about his plan. God gave his son Jesus to live a perfect life and to die a death. He didn't deserve to pay a price we couldn't pay. We thank God for who he is. We acknowledge God for who he is. And that's easy for us to do. Important, but easy. But then this person positioned himself in a way where he was submitting to Jesus and he's saying, you are the one who changed everything. I'm committing myself to you, God's son. 
Jesus, who gave me hope. And then specifically, he thanked him for what Jesus had done for him that day. Now, that's where you and I, sometimes we fall short. It's easy for us to, in general, thank God. God, thank you because you're so great. You're a good God, perfect God, loving, holy, merciful. All these things are true. But when you make it personal, there's a competition in your mind. And I know it's true because it's in my mind as well. To think about all the things we wish were different. All the ways we may have been wronged all the times that life didn't turn out the way we wanted it to turn out. And we have a competition, not with anybody, with ourselves. And to be able to focus on and thank Jesus personally for the things that he's done for us requires an amazing shift of in some worldview and at least attention in the rest of us. And I want to talk about that a little bit more as we continue. But these three things are really important. And the Bible says, and he was a Samaritan. All right, let's move on. Jesus asked three questions, simple questions. First of all, were not all 10 cleansed? Jesus knew the answer to that. Second question, where are the other nine? Jesus probably also knew that pointing out that they're not there. Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, I told you the words were important. Made you well here is different. The word or the compound word here, the phrase is different than the word cleansed. What this word means here is it means, it means, it's the word sozo. It means saved. So he had received a physical healing and a spiritual healing. And this man who once was an outcast with a death sentence became whole in every way. And the thing that stands out to me is that this man came back and thanked the one who made it possible for him to move forward in the first place. And there was something about that gratitude and that commitment that connected him with Jesus in a way where Jesus said, rise and go, your faith has saved you. So here are a few thoughts. Number one, gratitude. It's not enough to feel grateful we have to express it. Now, here's another time when you're gonna have a battle with yourself. And I'm just gonna jump to the end, it's pride. You have it, I have it, we're proud. I've struggled with it all week because I've had a week's head start on this. Been thinking about it for a while. So fight the battle within to resist what I'm gonna be sharing with you and at least allow for the possibility that this could transform not just your relationship with Jesus, which is by far the most important, but your relationship with the people who are closest to you, which by the way, reflects your relationship with Jesus. Don't know whether you believe it or not, but it's unmistakable. Your relationship with the people closest to you directly reflects your relationship with Christ. And your gratitude towards them is like a mirror reflecting your gratitude toward Jesus. It's not enough to feel grateful. We have to express it. I mentioned to you at the very end of our time last week that inexpressed gratitude is often experienced as ingratitude and it causes separation and, and relationship. If we don't express gratitude, it feels the same as rejection. We have a man here in our church who loves to give candy to kids. Candy man, Bob, loves it. 
You visit Capital City Church. If you're online and you want some candy, come to Capital City Church in the lobby. You'll find the candy man. He will give you some candy. And, and Bob loves to give. Now, if you have a child or a grandchild and this child is with you and Bob comes up and of course he says, is it all right if I give your child some candy? And, and you, you, in fact, hand him a sucker. What do you say to the kid? The first thing, you look down at your child and you say, what do you say? Why? Because express gratitude is only real gratitude. What if the child's like, well, I wish I had Skittles and puts the thing in his pocket and takes off. What if the kid said, well, I came through here 10 minutes ago, Bob, and you weren't here. About time you show up. Thanks for the candy. You'd be like, what's wrong with you, you little monster? You have parents. You've been raised in a barn. But we do the same thing with Jesus and we do the same thing with the people who are around us. What we demand out of our kids, we defer in our own lives, but it's just as ugly. If we don't express gratitude, it's probably our ego. Because all of us have had people in our lives and have people in our lives who make it possible for us to be who we are. Whether it's people from your past or people from your present. An inexpressed gratitude toward God or toward others is perceived and received as ingratitude. And ingratitude brings bitterness and separation over time. Think about two people in your life who you need to express gratitude to. We're going to sing a couple songs. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to be so much fun but challenging. And if you're not careful when we leave in a few minutes, we're going to leave a little different than the way we came in. Well, I want to remind you where we ended up because it's been a couple minutes and just go over these three thinking points one more time. Number one, it's not enough to feel grateful. We have to express it. Number two, if we don't express gratitude, it feels the same as rejection. Number three, if we don't express gratitude, it's probably our ego. Now, um, you can say personality, but many of us, especially men, need to stop being emotionally constipated and decide we're gonna be like Jesus. Wow. We gotta get over it. I'm one of you, I understand, but I'm so tired of explaining away the right kinds of things and blaming it on stuff that really, it's just an excuse in the first place. Uncommon faith. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to express your gratitude. Probably one of the only times I'm ever gonna ask you to do this in church, but will you take out your cell phones? I would love 100% participation. And I want you to send a text, if you can, to the two people who came to mind who are on your list. And I don't want you to just say thank you and send a thumbs up emoji. Thanks for being you, fist found. I'm talking about be specific. And I want you to send the text. A good friend of mine from first service, tough, man's man, an older guy. He came up, and both of us a little emotional. He said, I sent it. And I said, what'd you send? He said, my wife died. She died a long time ago. And he said, I shut down. He said, my kids paid for it. 
And he said, I told him, thank you. He said, I sent it. He said, it's over. He said, not the kids. He said, the text, it's out. And I hugged him. And who knows what's going to change because of his express gratitude. So I'm going to have uh, Sean play a little thinking music. And I want you to just send a couple texts. And see what God does both to your own heart and attitude and in the people who receive them. The service isn't over, so just keep up, stay with us if you're online. And I encourage you to do this from home as well. Pull out your phones and send these texts. If you're not done, don't stop. But if you're done, I'm going to talk to you for just another minute. So I want this Thanksgiving to be different and the best Thanksgiving ever for you, for me, for us. I want you to, to think about something. And this is where the reframing or the humility or the uncommon faith where this rubber really hits the road. The leper, the Samaritan leper, would never or almost certainly never have met Jesus unless he was both an outcast and a leper. His leprosy pulled him from Samaria to the borderlands and united him with the group whose only common theme was their suffering. And if you had asked this Samaritan leper what the worst thing that has ever happened to him in his entire life, what that was, the day before he met Jesus, he would tell you it was his leprosy. But do you know, if you were to ask him the day after meeting Jesus, what the best thing that's ever happened to him was, maybe he would say his leprosy. Now, I want to be careful here because I, I never want to mislead you. I certainly never want to be hypocritical. And... Um, this stuff's hard. I don't know what your leprosy is. I don't know what the worst thing is that you've ever been through in your life. Some of you I know. For some, it's a diagnosis, an illness. For some, it's a loss of a loved one. For some, it's a rejection. For some, it could be abuse. A disappointment that goes beyond your ability to even explain it to somebody. I don't know what your leprosy is. And to be able to say, thank God, thank you, God, for my loss. Thank you, God, for my sickness. Thank you, God, for my broken heart. Thank you for my disappointment. Thank you for my abandonment. I don't know that we can say that. But I do think that there are lessons that we learn along the way. And I wish I knew why things happen like this to people. I wish I knew why terrible things like leprosy happen. I don't know. The Bible says it happens to people who are just and unjust. It's part of living in a sinful world. It just happens. So it's going to happen. What I want us to do is to reframe the way we view our lives so that we can see the lessons along the way and become truly grateful because our tendency is to look at the leprosy and say, God, you shouldn't have allowed it. Did you cause it? You could have prevented it. Take it away. And we get so fixated and so stuck, we can never move forward. And what was the worst thing for this person became the best thing for this person because it allowed him to meet Jesus. And I don't know what yours is, but I know over the last couple of years, I've had one that hadn't been a lot of fun. A couple of years ago, almost to the day, I was diagnosed with a thyroid cancer. Now the the good news is, is that it's the thyroid cancer that almost certainly won't kill you. What the doctors have finally said is you might die with it, but you won't die from it. So that's good news, right? But I can't thank God for the cancer. Why did it happen? I don't know. People get cancer. Can't control it. 
Can't make it go away. But I can control and frame how I choose to think about it. So over the last couple of years, and I don't want to sound super spiritual or Pollyanna because I'm living this real time just like many of you are. I've kind of categorized my thoughts in three different ways. I'm a pastor, so they're alliterated. Nice packaged up in sermon form. Three Ps. Power, purpose, and people. Going through um, what I went through the last couple of years, which is so much easier than what so many of you have gone through. Um, at first, they didn't know. What kind of cancer is it? Do you have cancer? Is it the kind that's gonna kill you fast? The kind that's gonna kill you slow or the kind that you may live through? We didn't know. So there was a period of a couple of months that we were trying to find out. And you guys know the tests and you know the waiting and you know the phone calls and many of you are well familiar with the drill and you do not know if you're going to die or you're not going to die. So it makes you think about things. It makes just realize, it made me realize I have no power over my life and my circumstances. But I don't have the power to add one day to my life that God does. And that since he alone is in control, I'm gonna have to be grateful for that. Because if I was the one in control, I confess to you, I would mess it up. When you think about the possibility of death, you have to decide if you really believe in the reality of life in heaven with Jesus. And I'm thankful that even in the darkest moments, thinking about the possibilities with your imagination and WebMD running wild, that I can settle on the reality of what I really believe and what I know is true. And that's that death has no power over me or you. So I'm supposed to not be emotional as I get through this so that I can communicate and I've had a hard time. I've already done this once today. It still is very emotional because it's fresh and that's okay. I couldn't even send my text without tearing up. The second thing that I've learned is purpose. And over the last couple of years, there've been four times specifically that I've gone through procedures where the doctors have said, you may not have a voice after this is over. Uh, first was the surgery, then there were three follow-up procedures, and each time they said there's a chance that you're not going to be able to talk. Now, that's not the end of the world, but it's the end of a, of a ministry in the way that I've experienced it for 30 years. And I had to come to the point four different times, as recently as October, where I said, all right, Jesus, you tell me who I am just because I've done something for a long time, doesn't mean I'm supposed to keep doing it and it doesn't mean I'm good at it. So you tell me who I am. And each time he's allowed me to go through the procedures, including the surgery with a voice. And so, I, well, if I have a voice, I'm gonna keep using it to, to communicate and teach the gospel, teach the truth. So it reminded me of my purpose. Each of us have this purpose and sometimes your leprosy can confirm and convince you of why you were put on this earth in the first place. Number three, people. You learn who your friends are. You learn who your people of faith are. You learn who your prayers are and you learn who you can count on. My wife was the person I sent the text to in the, the first service because she's one of those. She is those for me. But when you can't count on yourself and all you have is your relationship with the Lord, then you have other people who show up and give you strength and point you toward what's true. Here I go again. Nobody get me a Kleenex. I'm not crying because I'm sad. My heart's full. 
Because I can tell you, I'm thankful. And I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for our staff, for our pastors, especially for Pastor Dan. Thankful for you. And we can choose to frame our lives however we want to. So this Thanksgiving, I challenge you to just do it. Father, thank you for my friends. 